Welcome to another episode of the I'd Rather Be Writing podcast. I'm Tom Johnson, and I am talking today with Dan Grabsky, a technical writer in Portland uh, with an interesting background. And we're going to be talking about um, some of the topics in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Persig, as well as uh, Dan's talk that he gave at Write the Docs, um, kind of following similar themes. So Dan, uh, before we jump into this, can you just maybe introduce yourself a little bit about like where you're based, what you what you do, what, who you are? Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me on, Tom. Uh, my name is Dan Grabsky. I'm based in Portland, Oregon in the beautiful Pacific Northwest. Um, my original background is actually mechanical and electrical engineering. I went to University of Rochester and got uh, degrees in those and worked in professional motorsports for about 10 years. I was in IndyCar racing. Um, Lived in Indianapolis for a good amount of time, was doing engineering with teams, you know, traveling around the world with that. Um, then, and, you know, when the economy kind of went downhill in 2009, I had some friends living in Portland and moved out to Portland and ended up making a jump over to the semiconductor industry where I was still doing engineering, but did more and more technical writing through that. Jumped through a couple other jobs and most recently I've been working in fintech. And I had been working for about two years as a software engineer with a fintech company and had a transition about a year and a half ago where I was offered a chance to move over to our tech content team. So technical writing while also retaining some of the software engineering work that I've been doing. So I'm, I've kind of got my foot in both worlds to, <laughs> to speak. Yeah, you, you really do have an interesting background. I mean, uh, this is part of why I thought you would be the perfect sort of person to talk to about this topic because you you clearly have a mechanical engineering background and and you know uh, software development mindset. Um, I don't even know how to really describe what I was trying to say, but you, you're used to working on things. Um, now, the the talk you gave at Write the Docs in Portland in 2023 was titled. Um, Zen, hold on, I got it right here. Zen and the art of auto manually creating API documentation and inquiry into process. I didn't make it to the last Write the Docs conference, uh, so I was just listening to these. Um, and this one really jumped out at me. Uh, I really, first of all, you're a great presenter. So th that, oh, thank that. you. It's very easy to follow follow your your train of thought and understand. And, you know, it was interesting. Um can you just tell us a little bit about that presentation? Like what was your main point or main argument there? Sure. And the, the kind of uh, the secret that is not a secret is that was actually my first presentation at a conference too. So okay. <laughs> um, it was, uh, it was still something new, but got to lean on other experience I've had. The, the real core of what I was getting at is, you know, I, I almost kind of, you know, backdoor talking about interpersonal relationships in the talk. There's a lot of focus, you know, there's talks everywhere about what are the technical bits of how we can create API documentation automatically, what, you know, what tool, what software tools do we have that can do this for us? But there's not as much insight into how is this going to interact with the people, you know, throughout the process. You're, you've got software engineers in the very beginning who are writing specs, you know, product managers, project managers, writing that code, going through uh, technical documentarians, writers, and then working their way out to the uh, the end users. And a lot of, you know, I read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, and a lot of what that's kind of brought to mind for me is that there really is that relationship between the technical aspect of things and having a deeper understanding of how we're interacting with it and, like, what's the basis of how we interact with it and what's the basis of this technical side of things. And at least to me, it feels like it's a little bit easier to get a, a deeper understanding as to what is going on behind the scenes. You don't have really that as much of that surface surface level insight anymore when you can understand, oh, wait, no, actually this documentation is be being used by a software engineer who has 20 years of experience or a couple of guys in a strip mall office who are just beginning their startup who've never seen code before um, you know it can really run the gamut and having that insight you know at the very least helps you tailor the documentation that you're writing but also you know hopefully lets you be you know i don't like using the buzzwords too much but helps you be more agile and keep up with these changes a lot easier 
So you're saying you, you really wanted to focus on like the actual people using the API and not so much just the, the technical process of pushing it out. Like you, you're talking about these different user types and so on. And uh, what about, you're also focusing in the talk about like the internal processes as well, internal stakeholders as well as the users, right? Right. Yeah. And I forget if I brought up this example in the talk or it's something that I've just evangelized at every single job I've been at is that there's always instances where, you know, in a professional situation where you feel like you're talking past each other with somebody Mm -hmm. where you're like, Oh no, we like, you're not understanding this thing. And they're saying, well, no, you're not understanding this thing. And Mm -hmm. it's, it's not necessarily that people aren't understanding each other. It's just, they're focused on very different values a lot of the times and being able to take that step back. Um, and you know, the, the technical merits of in this instance, the technical merits of both sides of this argument may be sound, um, but it doesn't make it any easier for two people to talk about it sometimes and being able to take that step back a little bit and Mm -hmm. understanding that, you know, your project manager is going to have this set of values, a software engineer is going to have this set of values. A manager mm-hmm. is going to have this set of values. And working down that line, it's, you know, you almost end up tailoring what the message sounds like to different people, not because you're trying to, you know, blow one over on somebody, but because you want to address their values. And, you know, you're not giving them a runaround. You're just trying to focus on the things that are more important to them. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I mean, um, I like that point of view, the the idea that you've got all these different perspectives going on and different people see things differently. And there's not just like a single path through a topic. Uh, Did you reread Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance like before your talk? Or is this a book that you read long ago that like came to mind when you're thinking about these things? You know, I, I had read little bits of it a long time ago, but never actually sat down and went through the whole thing. Um, And then as I, I had seen that Write the Docs is going to be in Portland and the uh, Revolution Hall is about two and a half miles from my house. I was like, eh, maybe I can do something. And then I you know, had the literal waking up in the morning. Oh, I need to do a talk on this. So I sat down and you know read through my copy that I have sitting right here <laughs> that has a, a bunch of uh, post-it notes for marking my way through it. And yeah, I, I wish I could say that this was this long journey of, oh, I'm going to find this amazing talk, but it was literally a, a light bulb moment of this is a thing. And <laughs> it was able to come all together pretty well. Yeah. Well, I, when I was listening to your talk, um, like I, I was thinking about this book that uh, I had read back when I was like 17. I'd graduated from high school. I was kind of sitting around in the summer and I read it. I didn't understand it much. I had a motorcycle in high school, so that's probably why I started reading it. (laughs) Yeah. But I mean, it's a, it's a long book, 400 pages. There's not a very, uh, explicit plot. You know, it's like the narrator struggle to sort of reconcile his previous self with his current self and his kid. And there's a lot of discussions about quality and, and, uh, sort of intuitive, thinking and and our relationship with technology, you know, so this is not like an easy book to just kind of plow through, but I like, I like your, your application of this, this, uh, uh, technology and people duality that you're kind of, um, collapsing and, and showing, uh, integration between, uh, I think that's a very sound takeaway. I'm wondering, do you have any more thoughts on, um, let's see, on some of these themes in the book, like what resonated with you in the book that kind of jumps out at you, any particular parts or, uh, themes? Yeah. And, you know, actually to back up a little bit, you you mentioned it's a bit of a slog to get through and that's absolutely true. It's you you read it and they're very, there's certainly some very dated things in the book. Um, there's a lot of, Uh, talk around, you know, mental health, that we have a very different perspective on these days that I think we've improved on a bit. And it's something that I I certainly don't advocate, you know, reading through the entire book and trying to apply absolutely everything verbatim to the, to real life. Um, It's, it's something that absolutely rubs me the wrong way. You see all of these, um, 
I want to say a lot of executive tailored books for, oh, we're bringing the knowledge of the East that you can apply mm. to your management style. And it feels like they're trying to just say, okay, put this template on your thing automatically and you're set mm. to go. And that's absolutely not the case. So I, I very much feel like taking some of these ideas out and, you know, looking at the lens through writing technical documentation is the way to go. A lot of, um, you know, probably the biggest thing that I picked out of it was it's very early on in the book. They talk about uh, his friend just takes his nice motorcycle to the shop to get anything done because they don't care to try to figure out what's going on behind the scenes, essentially. Um, and Robert Persick is very much a, I'm going to take this apart and work on it myself. I like the idea that, you know, you can handle setbacks and problems a lot easier if you understand at least a little bit of what's going on behind the scene. You don't need to know everything about how fuel air ratios work, going through a carburetor, or like intricate ideas about how spark plugs work. But if you know some of the basic background to how a four cycle engine works or a two cycle engine works, depending on the motorcycle, how, you know, you don't want to put two stainless, you don't want to put a stainless bolt in a stainless fastener without having some kind of anti-seize in it because all of a sudden you're going to have to cut them apart. There's a lot of these things that if you understand, oh, well, these metals work together this way, or this is going to seize up here, or this is going to rattle loose because there's all this vibration, all of a sudden there, you know, it doesn't give you all the knowledge to fix absolutely everything, but you can handle a lot more of these issues on your own and be ahead of the game. Um, you know, to take another of the motorcycle examples, if you think, you know, I, I've heard from Harley owners constantly that, you know, you wait long enough and everything rattles loose on the bike. It's just, that is just a fact of life for Harley owners. And, you know, you can put Loctite end bolts and nuts but somebody who's not thinking, oh, well, this is an option or this is something I should worry about, like they may ride along and just have parts flying off until all of a sudden their uh, their shifter falls off and they're stuck in first gear on the highway. So mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's a little bit of an extreme example, but I like being able to take that idea into writing this documentation. Like I, I dealt with actually an API not too long ago where the documentation was great. Like there was absolutely nothing wrong with the documentation factually. They went through every single endpoint. They talked about every function that each endpoint did. Um, there were, I forget, there's probably 20 to 30 endpoints in their greater API. But trying to put it all together was an absolute pain. It was very much a, oh, well, there's this information at this endpoint. Then you've got to correlate it with this information at these two other endpoints and, you know, I, I was trying to do pretty, what I thought was a pretty straightforward function that's a pretty, um, a pretty common use case for what I would think. And all of a sudden, I was having to hit five different endpoints to get all the data that I needed and sorting through some stuff and pairing, okay, there's this ID on this and this. And as I was going through, I, I looked at it and thought, this looks like a database developer looked at, made this because... For a database, this is an absolutely 100% the correct way to set this up. But for me trying to get a list of this data from this service, I'm having to go all of these places. And it it kind of talks to me to say that they, you know, they did an excellent job with the nuts and bolts of writing this documentation, but there wasn't as much thought of what's the end use case for this? And it, it almost seems really basic, but that's kind of what it comes down to. If if there's a little bit more thought into these, like how is this going to work together? Then all of a sudden you start thinking, oh, well, if there's something that I'm not expecting, we might be able to handle this better and so on. Um, so it, it was kind of an eye-opening uh, eye opening experience, especially you know months after I've given my talk and seeing it what felt like to me in, in a very black and white sort of presentation. Yeah. Well, there, there's a lot there to, to sort of unpack and sort through, but um, one, one part that's jumping out to me is, is this, uh, this sort of inclination to try things out yourself, to explore and use these systems as a way to deepen your understanding. 
I think a lot of times it's very easy to sort of um, fall into a, more of a spectator mode. I think this is a, another term from the book um, with documentation where I'm documenting these APIs, but I myself, I'm never using them. I'm never calling them. I'm never really like integrating them. I'm just sort of like getting some information from engineers about how they work and, and writing it down. Do you think uh, in order to be a really, in order to write really good documentation, you have to use the product in a way that's not a spectator mode? I, I definitely believe it's a huge help. I, you know, currently in the team that I'm working on, I'm, I'm really, the, well, I've got one other software developer who's just been starting, but the rest of the people are writers and I've been trying to help guide people to get them more experience in let's, you know, let's set up Postman for you and you can start hitting some of our own APIs and almost like leading writers through our software development onboarding process, which goes through Hey, how do you create this data and how do you hit all of these API endpoints to do what one of our customers would do? And it's it's not necessarily the exact same process as what a software engineer would go through, but being able to at least see a lot of this on the surface level, I think brings a lot of insight and you know insight that sometimes takes a lot longer to figure out than it might normally do. Because all of a sudden, instead of starting to write all this documentation, you know, you spend six months, and then all of a sudden somebody says, oh, well, this customer is actually using this API this way and it turns on the light bulb and you can start tailoring the documentation that way. I, I like being able to get in there and do the thing. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh, well, if I hit this endpoint, it actually doesn't have all of this data, but this data is really important that I wasn't expecting. And even, you know, I'm not complete. I'm not proposing that all writers need to be software developers or software engineers by any stretch. But at least, you know, the term that I like using is getting a ride along with mm -hmm. somebody who's running this. And it, it's another concept from software engineering of pair programming where you can pair somebody who has a lot more experience with somebody who has less experience and have one person looking over the other shoulder. And, you know, either the person with less, less experience or more experience can be, you know, driving the keyboard, so to speak. But you end up getting a really efficient transfer of knowledge that way. And at least in the software engineering world, it's good for getting new ideas that one person wouldn't necessarily get because you can bounce ideas off of each other. But in the world of technical writing, I like that you can you're getting to see this process being played out the way that your end user is getting to use it and understanding, Oh, this is, this is a whole ordeal having to get an authorization token for your endpoint. So, or, you know, for example, and it doesn't, I, I feel like it doesn't take a whole lot. And I, again, I don't want to advocate for technical writers to become software engineers or developers. So I don't, I don't want that to look like the big looming cloud that you have to figure out in order to get this great knowledge. But I, I definitely believe that at least being able to have a surface level understanding and seeing it all play out in person is really important. Hmm. Yeah. You know, you're making me think about my own projects and how in many ways I've, I've relapsed into spectator mode. Uh, in, in too many cases. Um, but I, I'm thinking also in context of the themes of the book, Persig is, is kind of talking about the relationship that people have with technology and this mindset of, of his fellow buddy, John, who's riding a BMW motorcycle, doesn't want to do any maintenance himself, doesn't want to really want to learn it. Being very similar to the mindset of a tech writer who's like, look, uh, I don't really want to know how this all works or, or so on. I just need to know the information that's necessary for the docs and I'm going to move on. It seems like it would be a much better setup for a technical writer to not have this, this mindset, to have more of a, a relationship with te technology where you want to learn it. You want to like try it out and experience it and use it. You know, even if you don't know what you're doing and even if it's very superficial, you're at least like tinkering around with it. 
How do you think people cross this bridge from spectator into kind of like tinker or user? Uh, how do you overcome that sort of ugliness with technology? Yeah, and it's definitely very tough, especially in a professional environment where you've got a lot of demands on your time. Say, oh, we need to get all of this documentation done for this deadline. And there's not an easy way to carve out that time for what's what is work that is not necessarily directly affecting your goals. Um, I, I remember there was, uh, there was an excellent article, and I'm completely forgetting who wrote it, called Be, uh, Being Glue, that talks all about unpromotable work and the idea of, um, especially for women, they get put, um, have a lot of work put on them that is like organizing meetings and admin work and doing a lot of the interfacing with different teams that all of a sudden, like this is all important, like critically important work, but it's not, you're getting this ticket done and getting this PR merged. So I guess we can't promote you because you're not doing the concept of real work. And I, I'm absolutely an evangelist for making, you know, from the top down, getting that culture of let's block out some time so we can learn stuff. I, I've had interns, I've had teams where I've literally said, look, let's block out two hours a week. I don't care what you're doing specifically, but go on Pluralsight, LinkedIn Learning, watch a video on how to learn a new thing or improve these skills. And it's, you know, it's silly that you almost have to be that draconian about <laughs> making sure that you have people block out that work, but without, <clears throat> without having that support in a lot of levels of an organization is really tough. And I, I kind of took the attitude of, well, if nobody else is going to do it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be that guy and just said, okay, we're going to do this. And a lot of times it really takes one person doing that who has enough pull in the organization that can keep that going and not get push pushback on it. But it's so critically important. Like, you know, Every company I know always talks about, well, we, we care about uh, professional development for our employees and a lot of places you go and it, their values in practice don't actually match up with that. Um, and that's, you know, that's a really, a really critical gap in policy and in values for a lot of companies that has to happen. And if we're not doing that, if we're not letting people have that time to, you know, Go, for, you know, if your company has a tech days or hack week to be able to have, say, a technical writer join a team full of software engineers and work on a project together randomly. That just doesn't happen. You have to be very intentional about doing it. And I, I completely acknowledge that this is not an option for some companies. Some companies, they're not going to let you have that space. And I hate that. <laughs> and, and I kind of want to go into these companies and just be like, no, you need to do this, which is why I'm such an evangelist about it myself wherever I go, because it is that important and you have to make that intentional time. I, I think that's a great point. Um, I, try to, I try to do that every now and then where I'll, I'll take an hour and just be like, I'm going to actually read some of these documents that have been queuing up that I know I should read, but I never yeah. get into it. And I want to learn more about this topic and I'm going to actually have some time to do it. It does, does provide a good space. Now, I think there's another roadblock that I'm trying to work my way through. Even if people are fully bought into the idea that they should be learning and growing and un increasing their understanding. There's sort of a mental hurdle to get over when you don't understand something. You have to, uh, Mark Baker, another tech writer, used to describe it as rearranging your mental furniture. Like it were, it's, it's sometimes painful to have to learn something new. Uh, for example, my, I, I bike to work on a bicycle and I used to be pretty good with adjusting my brakes when there were all the like pad V brakes that you just squeeze a cable and it pulls pads to a rim. And at some point the whole bike industry switched over to hydraulic brakes. And I'm like, I don't want to have to learn hydro how hydraulic brakes works and how, how I now have to adjust them. And it's, it's, there's like a block in me. And, and I think uh, there's a lot of resistance we have about like, yeah, I know I should be testing this API, but it's going to be so like, tedious and hard to kind of just learn it. And I think one 
part that really resonated with me in Persig's novel is uh, he's talking about um, some some bicycle assembly instructions for like a Japanese bicycle that that starts out it says require and it, you know it's it's kind of a humorous point but it says uh, re- assembling Japanese bicycle required great peace of mind <laughs> <laughs> and and this peace of mind is something that is sort of necessary have this kind of state of consciousness where you're not all frustrated and not like, you know, tense and stressed out and feel hurried, but can go slow and absorb things and kind of learn in a way that is more pleasing. How how do you get into this sort of state of, to have this peace of mind that enables learning to be, you know, more enjoyable and more possible? Yeah, and and full disclosure, I've never made the switch over to hydraulic brakes on bicycles either. All of mine are <clears throat> all of mine are rim brake bikes downstairs, and I've I've never made the switch. So that the full disclosure on my end. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, that's that's funny what you said about the the Japanese bicycle instructions about peace of mind, and partially that's a cultural thing, but also it it is important. The you know, you can get angry and upset at this piece of technology and it's not going to change how the technology interacts with you. It'll change how you interact with the technology and things might end up going worse. But in reality, technology is not affected positively or negatively by your emotional state. And it's something that you go into a professional environment and it's completely the opposite way. You're interacting with somebody in your emotional state absolutely affects how you're interacting with that person and how that person is going to interact with you. So you really, it's another thing, it, like I was saying, tailoring your message to the end user, you're tailoring your message to the thing you're working with. And, you know, everybody have, once in a while wants to be like data from Star Trek, the next generation, be able to just shut off the emotions and be very logical and work through the thing. And if you're purely working with the kind of the technological side of things or saying assembling this bicycle, being able to do that can help because, you know, the instructions may not be completely clear. I I remember reading a study, I think it was a couple of years ago, about integrated circuits of the little, you know, chips with little metal pins. Somebody had done a study about the documentation for those and they found that for any chip with more than i think it's eight or ten pins the documentation is never 100 percent correct 100 percent of the time there was something in the documentation that was not right like it was absolutely mind-blowing to me that these huge companies like motorola can't completely and correctly document a tiny little chip but it really made me think that yes okay we are trying to build this bicycle that doesn't have feelings and it's just a sack of metal and rubber and whatever else. And all of the surrounding stuff might not be ideal. Like there may be something in the instructions that skips over an assumption that they made that you need to know, but being able to, you know, not let that anger kind of take over can help almost smooth things out a bit more. Um, Because invariably, if you're getting angry and upset at a thing, it doesn't make your process any more clear-headed. Invariably, things are going to go more and more more and more wrong. And it's really difficult to be able to do that. Like it's, I think anybody who tells you that they're absolutely perfect at it is lying to you. It's something I still struggle with. I still get frustrated when things go wrong. But being able to take a little bit of time to step away, take a breath. And get back to that is really invaluable, um, you know. And that's part of because it does seem like it's such a huge thing. And another thing, full disclosure, your comment about rearranging the mental furniture is funny because for me, rearranging the furniture in the house is not an issue. I literally two weeks ago I was, we've we've been finally cleaning up our finished basement, and I was like, yeah. I want to set the basement back up into a little living room area. And like half an hour later, I had a couple of couches downstairs and a TV set up. Um, so I, I come at this from a little bit different perspective, but anyway, um, it's, yeah, it, it can be really useful to have that sort of approach of 
you know, maybe I need to step away from this for a little bit. And it, it leads really into one of the big points that I had in my presentation about incrementalism that, you know, it's not something that's actually talked about in the book, but it's a sort of synthesis of a lot of the ideas that I got out of that. And from my professional experience of, you know, big change is hard. It, it is hard to pack up all your stuff and move to a new city where you don't know everybody. It's hard to try to figure out how to rearrange your living room because you're frustrated with how things are set up. But you know, again, it's being intentional. Can you be intentional about taking a little bit of this journey at a time and saying, okay, like this is going to be good enough for now. Can we break it down into more manageable chunks? And again, it's not, it's not going to completely solve all your problems by any stretch, but it can be, it can be a tactic that you can have in your toolbox for like, my company is having a hard time trying to embrace this big change what can we do little by little and also acknowledging the worth of all those little improvements like we we all go to work not to try to just you know while away all the hours we want to make things better and you know the i like the saying don't let the great be the enemy of the good because you can sit down and i think it's more valuable to say well, okay, I've made this little bit of improvement, but it's an improvement. Otherwise, you can you can get really down on yourself, and it just makes things hard. <laughs> it's real I, difficult. I do like your your bringing in of incrementalism um, in your talk, and I I found myself wondering about that too. I was like, when I was listening to your talk, I was thinking, why is why is he kind of focusing on incrementalism? And, and this is an Eastern idea. Right? Isn't this part? I'm not very very familiar with the Toyota method or Kaizen or and, and so on, but I believe it's sort of Eastern to have like small gradual change and so on uh, towards improvement, continuous improvement. Um, but I think it even applies on some of these other tasks we've been talking about. Like if you've got a really difficult concept to document, or even just learning hydraulic brakes, which is still you know on my to do list, sadly. Uh, if you approach it in segment in chunks and be like, well, I'm going to spend 20 minutes or a half hour just kind of learning about it instead of trying to like take the whole day and, and, and ram some huge concept through your brain. Uh, I think it's a lot easier to kind of make progress on things. I wanted to ask more about, um, because you're, you're an engineer by background. I wanted to ask about this larger idea in this book about quality. Uh, now, it's kind of maddening to a lot of users that Persig like doesn't ever define quality, but that's part of like the definition of quality is that it's like undefinable. But my sense is that um, engineers often proceed intuitively through problems, like we're talking about, let's say you want to learn a system, an API, or how something works. It's probably not a lot of documentation, maybe, or if it is, it might not be that helpful. And engineers often have a knack for sort of like, guiding themselves through something without following specific steps or or processes, but kind of going with the flow through something. Is that a a real phenomenon or is that just my impression of how engineers sometimes proceed? I I feel it's true with also more background. So, you know, like I said, my, and my background is mechanical and electrical engineering, which is a little bit different than software engineering but something that was inspired in us very early when I went to university was that you're, you're there for four years taking all these classes about mechanical systems and, you know, thermodynamics, which I hated thermodynamics, but that's another story. Um, Material dynamics, all this other stuff. And you're kind of learning all the building blocks of what you're going to use in the real working world. And uh, the constant joke was when you started your first job, that's when you really started to learn how to do engineering. All of this, you know, intuitive feel for how a thing comes, it, it doesn't come unbidden, for, unbidden from the warmth of the sun and the light of the moon. Like it, it, people aren't just completely born with that from no inspiration. There's absolutely a lot of work that goes into that. And kind of like with Persig, he talks about working on this motorcycle on his own. And he 
absolutely didn't know just that, oh, well, this is how you fix this motorcycle. There's so much foundational work that goes into that, starting back from, okay, righty, tighty, lefty, loosey. That is a concept that a lot of people just don't have which way threads go on a bolt. Mm. And if you don't have that foundational knowledge, there's no way that you can get that intuition for, oh, well, I need to set, assemble this thing this way. So I I think that the intuition is absolutely something that you can instill in yourself with work. And it's what I feel is a very important cornerstone of what I consider engineering is being able to take all of these experiences and, you know, a lot of core rules and ideas and laws and be able to assemble them in a way that kind of makes sense for the project you're working on. Um, it was, you know, I used to play a lot of jazz music. And when I was in high school, I went to this kind of weekend camp thing with all of these professional jazz musicians. And we we're talking about improvising and how difficult that is to just blast into a solo section and, you know, do 16 bars of, improvisation on this <laughs> and this one sax old sax player was like that's not how we do it like i've got all these licks in my head because i've been playing for 50 years and i know for this song in this key i've got this set of licks and i just like program that in my head and then i go into the solo and i've got a whole bunch of building blocks ready to go and i throw them together and it sounds great and it was hilarious because we were going to play the next song in our little group. He's like, oh, oh, wait wait a second, guys. I got to do this thing. I got to program the licks into my sax. And he like makes this show of pushing a few little buttons in a very specific way on his saxophone. He's like, all right, I'm ready. It's programmed in. And he goes in and does this amazing solo. And we kind of take it apart of these are all the building blocks that he put together to make this work. Mm. Um, so it's very much a this isn't coming from absolutely nothing. There's a lot of experience that goes into it. And I know it can be frustrating too initially when you're first starting out that, okay, this doesn't make sense. And I don't have this intuition for how this should work. And like it, it happens and it takes time to start building that up. And then all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're like, oh, this API is missing this documentation because the end user is going to need this thing and nobody has thought about it, but I just know this is a thing. And all of a sudden it starts coming together. I, I really like your, your jazz example. Cause I, I have a daughter who plays a saxophone and I went to one of their concerts that where they did an improv thing. You, somebody would just stand up and they'd kind of do like a improv. And I, I was asking my daughter if like, uh, <laughs> I wasn't sure. I, I thought that they had just like memorized something, but she was explaining the same thing you were that like, no, it's not, it's not a memorized sequence of, of notes or anything, but at the same time, they do do a ton of practice, uh, and, and a lot of other techniques that sort of build up to it. It's not like they just turn themselves over to a complete, you know, the spirit of music or something. Um, right. Well, that's that's kind of reassuring because I think uh, I I think it's more of a mature uh, view of of how this whole process works. I think kind of the sometimes I I lean too far in interpreting persig as being like you just you just proceed intuitively, and it's like, well, how do you know all this stuff? You know, like <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah, there's a lot of learning that kind of builds up to that. So, well. Dan, we've been chatting for a while um, and we've covered a lot of great topics. I've really appreciated your perspective uh, and I really liked your talk. I'll put it in the show notes. Is there any last like uh, topics or resources you want to point users to or any last thoughts? Yeah, it's, you know, the amount of the amount of resources out there are kind of staggering. And I the, the example that I brought up earlier of being stuck in a place where you feel like you're talking past each other in a professional environment. I've lost track how many times that's happened. And l even learning those basic skills of like, let's try to step back from this. And can I rearrange my preconceptions as to what's going on can, can bring a lot of dividends sometimes. And again, I, I made a very big point in the talk about 
all of this is assuming that people are acting in good faith in the work environment. And I would love to say that that is the case in every single work environment. And it's not, there's, you know, we, we definitely need to be conscious and aware that we, we want to make sure that everybody is coming into this with good faith, because if that is the case, a lot of these tools will work. Um, if that's not the case, which, you know, it's sad that it happens, but it does, we can try to apply these tools and they're not going to work and we're going to get frustrated. And it's not a failing on our part that we're trying ourselves in good faith to make this work. And it's not that that's not a failing on us. That's, that's on the other person. So it, you can get really frustrated and upset sometimes when that does happen. And it, it sucks. It, really does suck and there's a whole lot of other issues that come with that but if we're we're still trying our best maybe we go to a different work environment we find a better place to to use those skills but that's that's not a failing on us we're still doing the best we can yeah well i think those are great thoughts to close on i i definitely think that um you know a lot of persigs talk about the motorcycle he says applies to ourselves as well right right you're working on you're, you're working on yourself too. And uh, understanding different viewpoints in the workplace, I'm sure uh, is something that carries over into our personal lives, our families, understanding these different viewpoints. Um, and and even though this, this whole book has many, many pages of philosophical musings, the real turning point in the arc is when he kind of crosses into the space uh, with his son and, and, you know, opens up and they start <laughs> to really talk, you know, and that's, that kind of uh, crossing into the social space, communicating is one reason I thought like your takeaway was so on spot, on, on, on target or or spot on uh, with the themes of the book too. So again, thanks for coming on to the show and I uh, really appreciated it. And I'll, I'll leave some show notes about your talk um, and uh, maybe your LinkedIn profile or something where people can reach out to you. Great. Thanks for having me on, Tom. It was a lot of fun.